We actually got behind a car yesterday and there was um, a Wyoming sticker and the, the letters were GBZ. Gabs. So Gabs. <laughs> She's with us. She's with us. She's with us. She's with us. That emotional moment from the parents of Gabby Petito earlier today, but the search continues for her ex-fiance, Brian Laundry. From Dog the Bounty Hunter to the feds, how much closer are authorities to tracking him down? We have live coverage coming up. The idea is that the vaccine is connected to some sort of master computer whose purpose it is uh, to work against the interests of black people and in the interests of Satan. Those strong words from broadcasting legend Bob Costas to Kyrie Irving, how his anti-vax stance and others in the NBA has one Hall of Famer saying they should be removed from the team. And God wants all Christians to get the vaccine. That's according to New York Governor Kathy Hochul. We'll talk with Pastor Lucas Miles about vaccines, the church, and if helping thy neighbor includes a shot in the arm. Great to have you with us. Live from our Chicago studios, the Donlin Report starts right now. Good evening. The pulse of America tonight. Those who are against the vaccine are dug in. They're walking off the job or threatening to walk. They're even invoking God. The governor of New York saying Christians who don't get the vaccine are not doing what God wants. She tells them to be good apostles, and we're going to play that for you in just a minute. We'll talk with a pastor about it as well. Meantime, in Massachusetts, dozens of state troopers are resigning or threatening to move to other states over a vaccine mandate. They have sued to put a hold on the requirement to get the shot. And in the NBA, which opens training camp this week, big-name players are refusing to get the shot. Here's Kyrie Irving of the Brooklyn Nets when asked, if he's getting vaccinated. I like to keep that stuff private, man. I'm a, I'm a human being first, and obviously living in this public sphere, um, it's just a lot of questions about what's going on in, you know, in the world of, of Kyrie, and, and I think I, I just uh, would love to just keep that private and um, you know, handle it the right way with uh, my team and uh, go forward. So it appears he hasn't. That's Kyrie's status. There's also Andrew Wiggins of the Golden State Warriors, who applied for a religious exemption against the shot, which was denied by the NBA. He now stands to forfeit half of his $31.6 million salary, to which he responded at Warriors Media Day, it's my problem, not yours. Irving and Wiggins play in states that require vaccines for fans to attend things like basketball games. The league, which has essentially allowed the players to do as they wish, is risking some of their biggest names not being able to compete in at least half of the season because of local and state vaccine requirements. Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, one of the greatest players in NBA history and a longtime voice on social issues dating back to the 60s, had this to say. I think they should be disciplined. Uh, I don't think that they are uh, behaving like good teammates or, or good citizens. Um, this is a war that we're involved in. When you're not going to be cooperative with that, uh, you're working against the effort to make everybody safe. So will some big name basketball players take their ball and go home? That's where we begin tonight with the Washington Post NBA writer, my old friend Ben Golliver. Ben, it's great to see you again. Been a long time. I know you've been at this for quite a while, covering this COVID situation. 90% of the league's been vaccinated, but it sure seems from the outside looking in, Ben, that these big name few who are not vaccinated are causing big problems for the league. Well, there's no question about it, Joe. Usually this time of year, we're talking about who lost weight during the off season, who added a nice jump shot during their, uh, their summer uh, training. And instead, I think the number one story in the NBA right now is this issue of vaccination and why didn't the NBA install a mandate for players and the unvaccinated players, how much damage could they potentially do to the league, either from a public relations standpoint, because fans um, you know, have come to expect uh, these players to be leaders on social issues, like Kareem Abdul-Jabbar said earlier, or by actually potentially spreading the virus to their teammates during games or you know, during practices or whenever they're together. So where does the league come down on this, Ben? What do they do ultimately? And, and where is the players' union on it? 
Well, the NBA has put in place a mandate for basically everyone besides the players. So media members like myself, if you're going to be at the arena, you've got to be vaccinated. Uh, coaches have to be vaccinated. Referees have to be vaccinated. But the NBA Players Union pushed back on the idea of a vaccination mandate, and they were successful. And the NBA said, look, we tried to do this. Uh, they didn't want to go for it. So instead, there's going to be separate rules for vaccinated players and unvaccinated players. If you're vaccinated, you don't have to get tested. If you're unvaccinated, when you're traveling, when you're eating, you're going to have to do that separate from your teammates, and you're also going to have to undergo regular testing. So there's going to be kind of a double standard here in hopes of preventing uh, spread from unvaccinated players to vaccinated players. Bob Costas was on uh, Banfield last night, Ben, and he talked about this situation with Kyrie. Here's a clip of that. We'll talk about it on the other side. To Kyrie Irving. This is also a guy, he is one of the best players in the league, but he's also a guy who previously has said that he believes the earth is flat. It's also scary that he's a vice president on the executive committee of the players union, and specifically, as insidious as this stupid conspiracy theory is that he has followed and liked on Instagram, uh, the, the idea is that the vaccine is connected to some sort of master computer whose purpose it is uh, to work against the interests of black people and in the interests of Satan. So in the end here, Kyrie is a hard one to understand. You can really never quite get what he means when he says something. Do you think he'll get the shot, Ben? And if not, does he miss the home games in Brooklyn? Does he forfeit his salary? How does it work? Well, it's a horrible situation for him because he happens to be a part of one of three teams right now that are going to face local mandates. So if you want to play home games for your team, in either New York City or San Francisco, you have to have the shot. Kyrie plays for the Brooklyn Nets, and so they're mandating that shot. He actually could not attend media day with his teammates because of those, uh, those health and safety protocols. And so he's facing a huge choice right now. Does he want to potentially sacrifice millions in salary and let his teammates down by staying unvaccinated? Or will he kind of get with the program? And look, he's facing pressure from everyone. You know, his teammates didn't want to put it on too thick, but they said, hey, we're counting on him to kind of do the right thing. We expect to be fully together. And look, it's a huge competitive issue here, Joe. The Brooklyn Nets are the favorites in the right. Eastern Conference to win the NBA title. They have one of their most important players unvaccinated. Meanwhile, the L.A. Lakers out here in Los Angeles, the favorites to win the West, and they're reporting that all their players are vaccinated heading into opening night, including stars like LeBron James right. and who, Anthony Davis. Who it's just a big said deal. that today, right? Uh, he said, after doing my research and things of that nature, I felt like it was best suited for not only me, but for my family and friends. And that's why I decided to do it. But as you point out, uh, NBA players are hesitant to tell other NBA players what to do. So we'll see how it develops. Ben Golliver, again, it's good to see you, my friend. Take care. Thanks for the time. Likewise, Joe. Take care. But you know there's people out there who aren't listening to God and what God wants. You know this. You know who they are. I need you to be my apostles. I need you to go out and talk about it and say we owe this to each other. We love each other. Jesus taught us to love one another. And how do you show that love but to care about each other enough to say, please get vaccinated because I love you. I want you to live. That was New York Governor Kathy Hochul telling religious New Yorkers getting the COVID-19 vaccine is what God wants them to do. Joining me now to discuss his perspective on whether God wants you to get the vaccine is Pastor Lucas Miles. Pastor, it's good to see you. This is something we really got into this afternoon in our afternoon meeting to talk about this, so we're glad to have you. Is there something in this comment that stood out to you? What was your reaction to it? I think this is a perfect example of not only spiritual manipulation, but also really, I think um, that the religious undertones of things like the, the COVID vaccine mandates have oftentimes been overlooked uh, by a lot of the news pundits that are out there. And so I'm really glad that you guys are dealing with this because there is a religious component uh, to this for sure, but I, don't, I, wouldn't, I would disagree uh, with the conclusion that the governor's come to. What do you mean by manipulation? So, I mean, you know, there's spiritual language here that this is what God wants. You know, here we have somebody who is an unelected uh, politician who is standing, you know, within a church service declaring what God wants for people. And I think that when we don't have scripture and verse next to things, it's very easy to kind of twist uh, biblical passages or twist biblical ideas 
to end up with a conclusion that really the Bible never, you know, clearly states, or um, uh, you know, uh, that 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 is something that is in fact, you know, uh, um, uh, I mean, really, this is antithetical, I believe, to Christian teaching, and it's being presented in the complete opposite. Well, do you think there's something in the Bible that does address this directly? I mean, it's open to interpretation and study, as we know. Is there a verse that you can point to that says you should or shouldn't get a vaccination? It, there's absolutely verses about how we should feel towards mandates. So for instance, 1 Corinthians 8, it talks about um, Christians who were presented with um, meat that had been sacrificed to idols. And so the, Paul's perspective in this passage was that some Christians might not have a problem with this, that they know it's just meat, it's going to cook up just the same, it's not a big deal. But other Christians could be very offended by this. And so the Christian who is not offended should never force the Christian who is offended by this, that they, their conscience is, is violated by these things, to ever put them in a position to violate their own conscience. And so here we have people that, you know, I would call maybe the stronger brothers who are willing to take the vaccine. And, and what, you know, if we're really following biblical advice here in this situation, it means that if that is the case, regardless of the merits of the vaccine, they should never, ever pressure people that this violates their conscience from a biblical standpoint. What about love thy neighbor, though, Pastor? That's one the governor talked about. I mean, you get this shot as much for everyone else as you do for yourself in the end. You know, this, this again, it's spiritual manipulation. I mean, one of the, the prayer... Uh, um, you know, doctrines within Christianity is the idea of free will, that God is sovereign, but he has given us a personal jurisdiction over our own lives. And if I don't have liberty for my own body, if I can't choose things for my own self, then what liberty do I have? And so I think that this is, again, it's a perfect example of how the left is not looking for separation of church and state, but they are looking for a church that is subservient to the state. And here they are using the church in order to carry out, you know, mandates and objectives that the state holds. Let me get you on one more thing, Pastor, before I let you go. We are up against the clock, but I've heard people say, God will protect me from this. And if I die from this, this was God's will and so be it. What would you say to them? Yeah, absolutely. So first off, I'm not, you know, I'm not sitting here today being pro-vaccine or, or, you know, against the vaccine. I'm saying that it should be a personal choice. I think for a lot of people, this is something they need to weigh out. If they have pre-existing conditions, if they have other health concerns, talk to your doctor and make a decision that works for you. Do your research on the vaccine. I know people have concerns about this being, you know, uh, the, the, maybe the, uh, um, the development of this vaccine versus other vaccines that we have. It's worth asking those questions and they should be able to ask those questions. Mm -hmm. And we need to not over-spiritualize protection and these things and put ourselves in dangerous situations, but ultimately it should be a personal choice, a personal decision, and we shouldn't use the Bible or Christ in order to manipulate people and, and call that the gospel. Interesting. Pastor Lucas Miles, thanks for the time. Appreciate it. Thank you. Joining us now for a bit more on this chef and New York City restaurateur, David Burke. So David, I guess my first question for you is, uh, what's this been like for you? You've got, we've seen this now, hostesses and staff members basically trying to enforce this and in some cases coming under attack for it. Yeah, so this, this pressure put on the, uh, on the, on the, bi the restaurant business um, to de deal with the vaccination uh, passports or vaccine cards for, uh, with proof of identity. I mean, it, it, you know, we have to hire more people to do so, but also some people get angry. People that come from out of town that might not have been aware of it, uh, tourists, sure. et cetera, <clears throat> that have had reservations and, uh, and, and simply forget to bring it. So they, you know, everyone tries to talk their way in anyway. So it does put pressure on hostesses and they, there's name calling, et cetera, et cetera. Is it, um, is it being enforced? You know, but it is, it, is, it it is what checked? it is. Huh? Is it being enforced and being uh, I haven't, I, I haven't, I haven't seen uh, any enforcers from the, city workers coming in and looking for vaccine cards but i think the enforcement uh comes from some of your your staff i mean if your staff is uh uh realizing that you're letting unvaccinated people come in there's the chance that that could leak out also so wow. you know you got to play by the rules yeah so um what but are there's you also you're asking you go ahead no you go ahead uh, you're also asking a restaurateur and a Hostess for uh, that are, are in the tipping business to, you know, when someone comes to your door and says, "But well, here's fifty dollars. I forgot my vaccination card." <laughs> uh, what do you? What happens there? All right. All right. So, what are you seeing with customers, Chef? Are you are you for, in New York anyway? Because I know I think you have restaurants in New Jersey as well. Are they going to New Jersey? Yeah, I have to restaurants try to avoid in Jersey. This, we're this seeing mandate? a lot. Of, we're seeing. We're seeing party business go out to Jersey because it's hard. If you have a party of 30 or 40 or 60 booked 
trying to get all 60 of them to agree on the vaccination card and make sure they have it is difficult. And some of the parties are coming out to our restaurants at uh, Orchard Park in northern Jersey um, for bigger parties because it's hard to find that space in New York. Right. And other people that are just having get togethers with uh, 12, 16 people in, uh, in Manhattan uh, it's, it just becomes a little bit difficult to get everybody on the same page with the vaccine cards. So business in Jersey goes up when New York puts restrictions on their diners. Same thing happened when they with the restrictions um, in, uh, with, with COVID in the early days. Right. Chef, uh, it's great to see you. David Burke, he's the New York City restaurateur. Um, thanks for the time and thanks for making us all hungry Thank in you. the kitchen there. We appreciate it. Take care. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't show any, any food this time, but thank you. Bye-bye. All right. Take care, Chef. Gabby Petito, remembered by friends and family as her parents spoke to the media in what was a truly heartbreaking address. We have the latest in the search for Brian Laundry from Brian Enton in Florida. We'll also have News Nation's Ashley Banfield weigh in on this at a wild site at Six Flags, why Maryland law enforcement is looking into this violent scene this weekend at an amusement park. Don't forget, you can follow us on social media at The Donlin Report on Twitter. Back after this. We actually got behind a car yesterday, and there was um, a Wyoming sticker, and the, the letters were GBZ. Gabs. So Gabs. <laughs> She's with us. She's with us. She's with us. Hi. She's with I us. Think, I think well, they held it together until the very end there. You saw just a bit, a bit of the news conference today from Gabby Petito's parents. They did that this morning, talking about the loss of their daughter and also the ongoing investigation into her death. And joining me now for more on that, News Nation's Brian Enton. He has been on this in Northport, Florida. He's in front of the laundry home. Brian, what's the latest on the search? Well, Joe, as far as the search or the manhunt, as we can now call it, there really wasn't much today. At the reserve, the swamp that we've been talking about for so many days, we had a helicopter up today, basically saw nothing. We did not see any police or search crews there. The new emphasis has really been on this campground, you know, um, Dog the Bounty Hunter first brought this up yesterday. He said he got a tip yesterday. We reported it last night uh, that the laundries, the mom, the dad, and Brian all went to this campground about 75 miles from here. It's called the DeSoto uh, Campground. He said they were there two times in early September. A lot of people thought he was crazy last night. A lot of people questioned him. Well, guess what? Today, we partially confirmed his tip with Pinellas County. We went through the records. We confirmed that on uh, September 6th through the 8th, Roberta Laundry, the mom, did in fact sign in to that camp crown, Joe. Brian, what else did uh, the dog have to say? Because I know that yesterday he was saying that he thought he would have a beat on him within 48 hours and then he'd find him by mid-November. Well, he's really, really zeroing in on this campground. We went out there today. It was interesting. Uh, basically, the workers there told us that they weren't allowed to talk about this. According to Dog, he got records, and he talked to different workers there who told him that the laundries were there two times. And according to Dog, the second time the laundries checked in uh, to camp, it was the mom, the dad, and Brian. He says it is possible that it was just the mom and dad who left the campsite, uh, which would really uh, add to the mystery of this mm -hmm. whole thing. Brian, you focused on the scene there in Florida on the laundry side of this story, if you will. I'm curious how much of the news conference with the Petitos you were able to, to see today and what stood out to you? I know a lot of people were talking about the tattoos that they've all gotten as a result. Yeah, I mean, we've obviously been here, but I always make a point to watch everything in full that the Petitos do because, um, you know, we're focusing on the search, but obviously at the end of the day, they lost their daughter and we want to keep that in mind. And what struck me, uh, obviously, was just how composed they are, what a tight-knit family they are, that the step-parents are all so close, that they all got this tattoo together, uh, and that they say they're going to work moving forward to keep Gabby's legacy alive. What was so incredible to me is that they said they don't just want this to be about Gabby. They want this to be about other missing people, too. Yeah, they also said that as far as they understood, the laundries have not spoken to law enforcement, correct? Yeah, they haven't spoken, Joe. We've been out here. It's been tense at times. You've got these protesters that show up. Let me show you one other thing that's been happening. Um, 
This is sort of a new phenomenon over the last couple of days. This has been spreading on social media. You see all these flowers that are arriving at the front door of the laundry's house. Mm -hmm. Basically, people are sending the laundry's flowers, but they're addressing them to Gabby, trying to make a statement to the laundry's because Gabby mm -hmm. lived here at one point, trying to tell the laundry's by sending flowers that they think they should now cooperate with police. All right. Brian Etten, as always, thank you for the update. We appreciate it. I want to bring in now News Nation's Thanks, Ashley Banfield. Ashley, your show has been just a must see television on this. You've been on this case from the beginning, and the information has been fascinating. I've been turning to it to get the latest. I'm wondering what you can add to the investigation and the significance of what you've learned about the timeline. Well, I'll tell you one thing that really stood out today, Joe, was that the family news conference revealed something I didn't know um, until they said it. And that was that Gabby's body may still be with the Teton County Medical Examiner's right. Office. We had all thought that she was going to be brought back, reunited with her family on Long Island on the East Coast, and that way back out west there on your map in Wyoming, uh, they'd have finished up their work and would be submitting their autopsy reports. But that East Coast Long Island news conference today, they said this was one of the harder things for them to understand, that they just needed to let them continue doing their work and that they were happy to let the sheriff's department out in Teton County and the coroner continue to do their work. And Joe, they said the words, she's safe with them in present tense, which made me think that She's not back with her family yet. There is mm -hmm. additional investigation that they need to do over a week since they recovered her body. That tells me a lot. And then, Joe, there's that timeline on the 27th, which is now becoming increasingly important to the minute because now we have people spotting Brian Laundrie to the hour, mm -hmm. going between the campground and Jackson to the restaurant with her, right. back to the campground, trying to leave and going back to the white van, all sort of coming down to five to six o'clock at night. Um, let me play a clip, Ashley, for you from this news conference you talked about regarding the family. And, and it struck me too about how they're using this tragedy. Let's play the clip and we'll talk after. Uh, social media has been amazing. Um, so I'd just like to thank everyone you know, for that. I, I do, it is greatly appreciated. That it was very helpful in bringing our daughter home. The role of social media in this case, Ashley, there are a lot of people who really truly believe that the public will be instrumental in ultimately solving this one way or the other. They have been remarkable. Um, the, the army of social media users who have chimed in to share with the FBI, not just amongst themselves, but with the FBI, credible tips, credible photographs, credible accounts, credible, credible timelines, Joe. Like I said, to the minute, we're going to show you this tonight on Banfield after 9 p.m. Central, 10 Eastern. The, the tips that they've given and the times that they've given regarding the transportation between the Spread Creek campground and the last time anyone reports mm -hmm. seeing Gabby alive, which was at that fight in the restaurant in Jackson, it's starting to look like she may have lost her life after 1 o'clock on the 27th, somewhere mm. between that restaurant and back where Brian right. was uh, seen by himself trying to, you know, make a break for it and leave right. the campground. Hey, Ashley, one more thing before you go. When we first learned of this case, there were a lot of people who wondered if Brian Laundrie were dead. Um, I'm not hearing that as much now. What are you hearing? Because you're talking to a lot of people who have experience in these kinds of searches and dealing with these kinds of cases. Do they still think he's alive? Yeah, I think for the most part, uh, when you have a, a most wanted, uh, you don't go on the assumption that they're dead. You go on the assumption that you're going to get them. And I believe that that right now is what law enforcement are still doing. Otherwise, they wouldn't be showing up and saying, now we want DNA, which is a whole other story. Uh, showing up on Sunday and asking for an item with DNA on it and not going into the house yourself as the FBI to get it, that, that doesn't square with me. However, there is a curious uh, development, and that is that if Brian Laundrie were dead in that swamp, 
Mm -hmm. um, you know, people who are experts in the area have told Marnie Hughes, have told other reporters that you would have seen activity of some kind of uh, carrion, some sort of dead carcass, like whether it's buzzards or whether it's animal activity, there would have been some evidence that there mm -hmm. was, uh, and to be fairly blunt here, a feeding frenzy off of a body. So it, it's for that reason that many don't believe he is in that swamp at all, alive or dead. Wouldn't be able to survive it alive because it's a flood zone. Right. And wouldn't be, um, it would be far too obvious if he were dead already. In all right. The, in the swamp. Ashley, it's great to have you as always. We appreciate it. And uh, there will be much more on this conversation. It'll continue tonight on Ashley's show. Banfield, 10 Eastern, 9 Central. Also tonight, guest Neil deGrasse Tyson. Again, that's right here on Banfield, coming up on News Nation. Stay calm, steady, and de escalate. We are not going to attack you. General Mark Milley saying that was his message to the Chinese following the 2020 election. He also had a message on pulling out of Afghanistan. Don't remove all the troops. Plus, daylight heist, brazen thieves ransack a beauty store with customers inside. The incredible video coming up. That's in our Policing in America segment ahead. The buck stops with me. That's what President Biden said about the U.S. withdrawal from Afghanistan. He also said no one advised him on keeping troops in the country. Here are his words from August. No one told your military advisors did not tell you, no, we should just keep 2,500 troops. It's been a stable situation for the last several years. We can do that. We can continue to do that. No, no one said that to me that I can recall. Today, however, Joint Chiefs of Staff Chairman Mark Milley testifying with Defense Secretary Lloyd Austin and CENTCOM Commander Kenneth McKenzie, where we heard a different story. I recommended that we maintain 2,500 troops in Afghanistan. I can tell you with 100% certainty that the military voice was heard and it was considered. It was considered but not followed, correct? Presidents are elected for reasons. They make strategic decisions. My assessment was we should keep a steady state of 2,500, and it could bounce up to 3,500, maybe something like that. And that if we went below that number, in fact, we would probably witness a collapse of the Afghan government and, uh, and the Afghan military. And that, of course, is exactly what happened, a collapse of the Afghan military and government. Brett Velikovich, former military intelligence analyst, joins us now. So, Breda, it seems like the collapse was foreseen, at least by the military, and they left it up to the White House, and the president went his own direction. Fair? Absolutely correct. And it was very clear today that our credibility is being destroyed all around the world. I mean, I, I was taken aback by a ton of the responses that these generals gave during uh, that, their testimony today. And somebody here is lying. It's very clear. Somebody's lying. Either President Biden's lying or these generals are. And, you know, the fact is that Senator Cotton asked them point blank, you know, did you ask for additional troops um, to be left there on the ground? And it was clear that that they did. And they were kind of dancing around that answer quite a bit. But um, if only a month ago, President Biden, you know, said on national television that no advisors provided any information um, as to you know why we should keep additional troops in there and that we should keep these 2,500 additional troops that Kabul didn't fall. And it's just ridiculous. I mean, and, and like some of the other senators today during this testimony, I, I personally want to know when the resignations are going to start. You know, when are leaders that were involved in this botch withdrawal from the get-go going to have the integrity to take responsibilities for their action? Because I personally know a number of different advisors who warned the administration that there would be uh, this collapse. And veterans like myself have been screaming at the top of our lungs for years. Folks that have been there and seen this from the ground and have deployed to that region knew exactly how um, corrupt the Afghan government was and that the troops were not ready to defend Kabul. And um, it's just appalling to, to hear that you know, folks now are sort of looking at this and asking, you know, the, why the president didn't uh, make the decision to keep either right. some troops in there or at least, you know, make a, a, a better transition as, as this withdrawal took place. And the, the fact that they were sitting there, um, you know, commending themselves on what a successful logistical mission this was on their way out, I just think is, is right. a joke because we still have Americans in there. They're still being held hostage. And we've got uh, 13 service members dead, and people need to answer to that. Right. Well, you've just summarized a lot of what we heard today, no doubt. I did want to play a clip from you about where General Milley says he didn't go rogue. He told the administration about these calls we've talked about to China. Let's listen.
certain that President Trump did not intend to attack the Chinese. And it is my directed responsibility, and it was my directed responsibility by the Secretary to convey that intent to the Chinese. My task at that time was to de-escalate. So the general admitted to talking to several of these authors about these books that we've all seen, Brett, but, but then he said, I haven't read any of the books. There was certainly outrage when this all came out. Now that you've heard from him, do you think that's warranted? No, I mean, I, I think the outrage is absolutely warranted, of course. I mean, it, it was very eye-opening to hear some of the conversations that the general was having directly with the Chinese government. And I think one of the senators said it best when he asked if the head of the PLA would um, warn Americans or, more, or warn General Milley if they were about to conduct an attack against Taiwan. And he couldn't answer that question because the truth is the Chinese government would never uh, you know, talk about their intentions of going to war. And so why are we sitting here pandering to them and having these conversations with the Chinese military to say that, hey, we're going to let you know if we ever go to war. I mean, what, you know, operational security, what in what world is that a smart thing to do? And so I just don't understand why we would ever signal our intentions when especially the, the Chinese government wouldn't do that. And so it's, I'm glad that a lot of these senators took them to task. And this wasn't a a left issue or a right issue. I mean, bipartisan across the board, people are upset about this and and rightly so. And so, you know, this is the first situation that I've seen in a while where where people are really being held to task mm -hmm. with, with this response to Afghanistan, and I hope it continues. Well, it will tomorrow, as I understand. Uh, Brett Velikovich, national security analyst, also known as the drone warrior. Thanks for your time tonight, Brett. Thank you, Joe. Policing in America, criminals and vandals becoming more brazen in recent months. Many of these crimes happening in broad daylight and in full public view. Take a look at this video out of Florida. And a warning for you, it is a bit graphic. Okay. That was a traffic stop that turned into a life and death gunfight. The gunman fired more than 60 rounds at law enforcement. One of the deputies ultimately shot the suspect several times, killing him. The other deputy was shot in the leg, also suffered a concussion. <laughs> this is from Maryland, a wild weekend at Six Flags, an amusement park just outside D.C. Video shared on social media show teenagers getting into multiple fights, destroying cars in the parking lot, all this chaos happening during the popular Fright Fest event, forcing the park to ultimately shut down. And then there's this video from Chicago. Criminals robbed and ransacked an Ulta beauty store in broad daylight wow. as stunned customers looked on in disbelief. These videos surfaced just as the FBI releases crime stats for 2020. And for the first time in four years, the estimated number of violent crimes in the nation increased when compared with the previous year's stats. Violent crime up 5.5% while murders spiked in cities across America, jumping nearly 30% compared to 2019. That is the largest single-year increase ever recorded, that 30% number. Joining me now to talk about these numbers, former federal and state prosecutor Pat Brady and also retired police commander T.J. Smith. Uh, welcome to both of you. It's great to have you in. T.J., let me start with you, if I can. When we see these videos, uh, it's hard not to ask what in the world has happened to us. Why don't you start us off there? Yeah, you know, um, good to talk to you again, Joe. And, you know, it's just, I think we have just spent an inordinate amount of time apologizing for bad behavior. I mean, we've seen people across the country, whether it's the politicians or the prosecutors or whomever, really wave the white flag of, we're not gonna prosecute you for this, we're not gonna prosecute you for that, as opposed to trying to change policy while at the same time holding people accountable. And now we're seeing the results of that, which, is basic anarchy in some cases. Right. We've seen this in California. We're seeing it in Chicago. We see this right outside of DC. The kids were at an amusement park where you'll see some people in certain parts of the country say, well, we need more things for the kids to do. They were at an amusement park and they went outside of the amusement park and decided to 
ransack cars and jump on them and bust windows out for no purpose whatsoever. Yep. That's not normal child behavior, and it's unacceptable. Pat, you think, TJ mentioned the uh, the prosecution angle of this. You think that's a big part of it? Oh, it's a huge part of it, and particularly in the urban areas he just mentioned. We sit here in Chicago. We have one of the most lenient prosecutors in the country who believes her office is a social service position, and there's a correlation between the fact that the jails are now empty and the crime and murder rates and, and, and violent crime rates are what they are in Chicago. It's an approach that they take in L.A., they take in Chicago, I think they take it in Philly, where it, it, they're not being prosecutors, they're usurping the law, they're putting their own political agenda. Uh, what is that agenda? To, they think that that office should be a social service office. And having served in that office, I know TJ was in law enforcement, that is the prosecutor's office. Your job is to prosecute crimes, administer justice, but they're also what we never hear about anymore, and TJ touched on it. What about the victims? They're victims in all these crimes, and we don't ever hear anything about victims anymore. It's all about, you know, we got to give these kids a, you know, a juice box and a pat on the head and send them home. Some of these kids need to spend the night in a jail and realize that this, you cannot engage in this kind of conduct in this country. It's gone way too far to the left, and it's part of the progressive agenda, and it has never worked in this country. Well, there are angles of it that have worked, TJ, that I've seen, where people are trying, cities are trying this, where they don't prosecute low-level misdemeanors, and they say it's cut down on the worst crimes, higher-rated crimes. Are you seeing that at all? Is there anything to that? Well, I'm okay with that if that infrastructure is built up where you can handle it. If that infrastructure isn't built up and you're hoping and wishing that it's going to just work, then you might create a larger problem. And that seems to be the case in a lot of places where you just see complete anarchy, where those smaller crimes have just escalated and there's mass confusion whether it's from the right. general public whether it's from the police officers whether it's from just line prosecutors themselves what should police get called for and when you see that level of confusion guess who's lurking the criminal element we can't just think that they're stupid people because they aren't they're looking at this mass confusion they're laying in the bushes and they're attacking their prey and their prey are victims like you and i waiting to be attacked by them and that's what's happening across the country and that's what we're seeing with this increase in murder rate across right. this country unfortunately 60 shot in Chicago last weekend, including a police officer and a paramedic. 46 police officers have been shot at this year in Chicago. 12 of them hit, just some of the numbers. T.J. Smith, it's good to have your voice as always. Pat Brady, it's always good to see you. Thanks, Thank you both. Likewise. Take care. Instagram putting the brakes on plans for a kid's platform, what it means for the social media giant after facing scrutiny for knowing the app negatively affects young girls. Plus, what's the final cost of a $3.5 trillion spending bill? When you add some high stakes negotiations in Congress, it's zero dollars, at least according to the president. We'll do some of that math next. Time for a little math. All right, let's say you have something that costs, uh, I don't know, three and a half trillion dollars, like the president's spending plan Democrats are trying to pass. Add to that some last minute political wrangling brought on by concerns about the bill's price tag and and then how much does it cost? Here it is, zero dollars, nothing, not a single trillion. The president tweeting, my Build Back Better agenda costs zero dollars. So how exactly does all of this work? Let's ask Tom Schatz, president of Citizens Against Government Waste. Tom, I was not a math major, so explain this to me. Well, nobody here knows math. I mean, no one in Washington can calculate anything other than just taking our money and wasting it. That's the way it's always been. But to say it's zero dollars is just an outrage. They don't know how much it's going to cost because the Congressional Budget Office has not done an estimate, a score as it's called, for any more than about 1% of the bill. Could be three and a half trillion. I've seen four and a half. I've seen five. I've seen seven. And the numbers are just the beginning. The policies in this legislation are going to devastate a lot of things that we have been counting on for many years, like the healthcare industry. Uh, dozens of new drugs that won't be developed over the next 10 to 15 years because there are price controls imposed by a bill called HR3, which is just going to be a disaster. You know, ALS and Parkinson's and sickle cell, things they're already working on in the pipeline won't be developed because nobody's going to invest knowing that the government's going to control what they can charge. So, so Democrats, Tom, say that, that the tax increases will cover this. It's a net zero. That, that's, that, that's not going to happen, you, you say? 
No, the Ways and Means Committee has put out about $2 trillion in new taxes and tax increases, and by the way, some taxes for the first time on tobacco and harm reduction products, which mostly hit. Uh, it's regressive. It means people making under $400,000 will be the most adversely impacted. So two trillion doesn't equal three and a half, four, five, or seven. That's for sure. <laughs> All right. Well, again, we, we, we're always hearing that these things don't cost anything, uh, and in the end, we want to believe it. But meantime, the, the national debt is at what almost 30 trillion dollars. Tom Schatz, president of Citizens Against Government Waste. It's good to see you. Thanks again for the time. Thanks. Instagram pausing efforts to develop a version of its photo sharing app for children under 13 years old. That's according to the Wall Street Journal. The company's been facing scrutiny after a scathing journal expose revealed the social media platform knew its app could negatively impact teenage girls. Instagram says it'll take this time to discuss concerns with parents, experts, policymakers, and regulators. Let's bring in now financial advisor Tracy Burns, friend of the program. Let's get more on this, Tracy. I'm guessing this pause is probably a move most, if not all, parents will support. For sure. I mean, look, unless you can somehow guarantee that mom and dad are going to sit down with the child who's under 13 and, and go through this Instagram app together, then go, go for it. But it's just not going to happen. The isolation that these apps create. I mean, we know suicide levels are up. We know depression levels are up all because of what kids see on Instagram. Why would we subject our little ones to that as well? Well, there are platforms, Tracy, that do have younger versions, and they would argue that the idea, I guess, mm -hmm. is to provide more parental controls and more monitors and that these kids ultimately are going to want to and ultimately use these apps at some point underage. We also know that the, there's a monetary issue here as well, right? They want to get the kids really young and keep them. The problem is their attention span is that of a flash cube. I'm probably the only one old enough to know what that is. And that, that by the time they get onto Instagram, they'll be, it'll be long gone and it won't be cool anymore and they'll move on. So this will all be for naught at the end of the day. Bottom line is this stuff pr promotes really, really bad behaviors in kids and the isolation and the physical laziness that comes out of it, let alone the mental problems that we see from our kids, right. it, it just shouldn't be without some sort of strict regulation. We just have uh, 30 seconds or so left, Tracy. I want to get you on the debt ceiling. It seems like both parties use this as a political football. This will get done, right? In the end, it'll get passed. Of course it will, and it's the same scare every single time. The problem is there's no political spine in Washington to address it once it's passed. You can't try to find Jesus two minutes before the ceiling is about to expire. You have to do it afterwards and really, really think it through. Our spending is out of control, and we see that, and yet we continue to spend more money. All right. A lot of religion and money in the show tonight. We appreciate your insight, <laughs> Tracy, as always. Good to see you. Take care. Thank you.